Welcome to church today. So glad to have you here. Uh, turn around and say hi to two or three or four people around you. We're so glad that you're here today. Glad to have you all watching at home. Want to give you a quick update on Pastor Tony. Uh, he went to the, to the doctor on Friday, got a good report, and uh, healing up like he's supposed to be. Just have to be patient, and that's hard for a Marine. So y'all be praying for him. He's, he's, he's coming along good. So anyway, also don't forget uh, this Tuesday night, Trunk or Treat, put on like three or four coats, five coats. I don't know. It's going to be a little chilly. So anyway, hey, we have something else very special coming up this Saturday. Good morning, I'm Alan Snyder with the Men's Ministry Group. Uh, this Saturday, or next Saturday at 8.30 a.m., we have a special speaker, uh, Pastor Dan uh, Bell, who, uh, David Bell, is going to be speaking to us about Israel and whatnot, so, and kind of the happenings over there and give us a little bit of education. So wives, mothers, uh, as I'm calling it, daddy daycare, just drop off, drop off your men, we'll feed them, we'll uh, educate them a little bit. You can go shop and spend some money and come back and pick them up about 10 o'clock and we'll be all done. So anyway, next Saturday, 8.30, uh, love to see all you men there that we haven't seen in a while. Come join us, we'd love to have you. Thanks. That daddy daycare, I don't know, don't tell my wife that one, she might get some ideas. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, this is what's happening at Kimberly City Methodist Church. Kimberly City Methodist Church, we are so glad that you are here today. Uh, we'd love for you to experience any one of our three distinctive worship experiences. At 8 a.m., we have Front Porch Gospel with its toe-tapping bluegrass gospel music. And then at 9.15, we have uh, traditional service with our choir, our bells. Uh, and then at 10.30, we have a service with more of a cafe setting. Great. Any one of those free experiences are available to you each and every Sunday here at Kimberly City Methodist Church. Trunk or Treat. It's coming soon, Tuesday, October 31st, and we need candy. We have a box set up out in the foyer that you can donate your candy so that we have plenty of goodies for the kitties when they come. Also, we need you to sign up to host a trunk. Uh, the sign-up sheet will be in the office, and uh, this is an annual event that our church really does a great job uh, as we, we present this out in, in the parking lot. It's going to be Tuesday, October 31st, but we need your candy and we need people to sign up to do it.
At this time, I would invite you to pray wherever you're sitting as I lead us in a prayer. And uh, we will conclude the prayer using the words that Jesus gave us uh, as a model to, to pray with. Let us pray. Father, indeed, your name is majestic. And we're so grateful, oh God, that not only are you a great God, but you're a good and loving, compassionate God. We thank you this morning for the opportunity that we have to gather here together to hear your word proclaimed both in the lyrics of song as well as in sermon. And Father, we just ask that you would guide uh, Wes as he proclaims your word this morning. We ask that you would guide those who have a part in the music program that it might inspire us and cause us to draw, to draw closer to you. And Father, for those who are not here this morning, for whatever reason, we pray that you will be with them in a special way. For those who are viewing online, we pray, God, that you will open their hearts and their ears to what you have to say through your servants. And we just uh, pray this morning for Pastor Tony, that indeed he will continue to heal and that he will be better much sooner than even expected so that he might resume those things that we know he loves to do in order to glorify your name and to help each of us. And so, Father, we ask you to open all of our hearts and our ears that we might hear what you have to say to us this morning. And now we pray to you using the words that Jesus gave us when he prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. When all is lost, in him we're found. Jesus is the way. He plants our feet on solid ground. He's the way, the truth, the life, leading us homeward every day keeping us ever in his sight. Jesus is the way. We know the Lord is always near. Jesus is the way. Thank you. 
And it won't be long that we have a Christmas cantata coming your way. I know that's, that's weird to say, but uh, I guess I get into the Christmas season a little earlier because I have a show and we start Christmas next week. <laughs> because it's Branson, and November 1st starts Christmas. Which, by the way, don't forget Tuesday night to, for, for a trunk or treat here. So, and next Sunday, next Sunday is Veterans Sunday here at Kimberly City Methodist Church, and it's always a great celebration. We love to, to honor our men and women that have served in the armed forces, and so anyway, uh, that reminds me though, there's a story that I need to share with you about that. One Sunday morning, the pastor noticed little Alex staring up at the large plaque that hung in the foyer of the church. The plaque was covered with names and small American flags were mounted on either side of it. The seven-year-old had been staring at the plaque for some time, so the pastor walked up, stood beside him and said, quietly, good morning, Alex. Good morning, pastor. He was still focused on the, on the plaque. He said, Pastor McGee, what is that? What is this? Well, son, it's a memorial to all the men and women who died in the service. Soberly, they stood together, staring at the large plaque, and little Alex's voice was barely audible when he finally managed to ask, which one, Pastor? The 8 o'clock, the 9.15, or the 10.30 service? Hopefully that will not be your experience here today. <laughs> if someone could catch those doors real quick there that's, that's, and close those, that would be wonderful. Um, our scripture today is found in Numbers chapter 13, a very familiar story about the 12 spies that were sent to spy out the land. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. But uh, before that, in May of 1804, President Thomas Jefferson commissioned Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, Lewis and Clark, to search out a possible route to the Pacific Ocean. Now Jefferson, like many scholars of his day, believed in the existence of the Northwest Passage or some other water route to the Pacific Ocean. Lewis and Clark began their journey by heading west from St. Louis on the Missouri River, right here at home. They believed that they would simply follow the Missouri River to its head in the Rocky Mountains, and once there, they would find another river that would lead them down to the western side of the mountains straight to the ocean. Makes sense, doesn't it? What they found was completely different, though. The journey was anything but easy, and nothing was like it was planned. They spent many days carrying their canoes over the Continental Divide, think about that, through the snow. And once on the other side of the divide, they didn't find another water passage, so they had to continue carrying those canoes and supplies through the deep snow until finally they found what we now know today as the Snake River and followed it into what is today the state of Washington. And once there, they found the Columbia River, which took them to the Pacific. On their journey, Lewis and Clark ran into many obstacles. They faced harsh weather, hostile natives, turns and twists along the trail that they never expected. They had to go over the falls and rapids of the river and they, had to, the, they could have given up at any time along their journey and turned back. But when you read their journal, you find a surprisingly optimistic view. Here's just one of the many quotes from the journal written one year into the trip. The country on both sides of the Missouri continues to be open, level, fertile, and beautiful as far as the eye can reach. They must have been somewhere up in Nebraska or something like that. When you read their account, you cannot help but sense that these men were very optimistic about their journey, and they never doubted they would be successful on their mission. They were very optimistic and had great faith. Today I want to look at another group of, of uh, people that were sent on a mission to search out an unknown land and bring back a report. Now names are really interesting. Parents often spend countless hours deciding what to name their children, although I wonder about some Hollywood celebrities about how long they took to name some of the names they've named their children. God bless them. We know names are important. In some countries and cultures, names carry significant meanings intended to shape the character of the child. And in some cu cultures, a first or middle name is handed down for generation to generation. In almost any culture, 
there are some names that become very popular for a time. Now here's some names you might remember. Shemua, Shafatat, Egal, Pati, Gali, Gadiel, Gadi, Amiel, Sathur, Nabai. Does that sound familiar to you? Never heard of these guys? How about these two, Joshua and Caleb? People have named their son these two names for thousands of years. But why? You see, the first names I read were the names of the ten spies who went, by, who went by God's order to search out the land and came back with a negative report. Joshua and Caleb, on the other hand, were the two spies who came back with a favorable report, encouraging the people to obey God and enter the land that God had promised them to live by faith. In life, there are optimists and pessimists. In this story, we see both. The optimists focused on what can be, the possibilities, the opportunities, the potential. And the pessimists, on the other hand, tend to focus on the problems, the obstacles, the potential doom. Optimists tend to operate by faith and not by sight, but pessimists operate sometimes by sight and not by faith. Now, one thing that's very interesting about these 12 gentlemen is that they all saw the same thing. It wasn't like they went to different areas and saw different things. They all saw the same thing. All 12 of them saw the wealth of the land. Remember that they said that they came back with grapes that took two men to carry the cluster of grapes. I love grapes. How many love grapes? I, I love grapes. But I don't think I've ever seen grapes that big that you had took two people to carry them like that. That must have been something else. The land really did flow with milk and honey. God had told them that he would give them this land in Exodus chapter 3, that it flowed with milk and honey. So they all saw that. And they all had been part of the immediate history of the children of Israel. And they'd seen the good things that God had done for his people. First of all, they took how that he rescued them out of slavery, out of one of the strongest nations on the face of the earth, Egypt, with one of the strongest armies on the face of the earth. And God humbled Egypt with ten flags and set his people free. That must have been amazing to see. And then when they got to the Red Sea, God parted it. They drew, walked across on dry land. Then God brought the waters back on the Egyptian army so that they couldn't catch them. When they were in the desert, God fed them with manna from heaven, kind of a bread substance. But then they whined and complained and got tired of the bread, and so God even gave them meat, gave them quail. When they needed water, he gave them water. And now he was giving them a beautiful land just as he had promised them. And think about this. God led them daily. It wasn't like God went off away and came back. He was with them all the time. A pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. They saw that every single day. But still, they can, some of them can only trust their eyes and not their God. They wanted more than just food and all this miracles. They wanted security. Now listen to me this morning. Security could be one of the worst enemies for you achieving what God wants you to do. People settle for security. People allow themselves to be put into bondage for security, even to this day in, in totalitarian nations of the world to feel secure. They all saw the same problems. The strong enemy, there was a lot of them. The cities that were walled with great walls. There were giants in the land, they saw the giants. There were enemies everywhere. Now they all saw the same thing, but they had two distinctly different reports. Remember, they all saw the same thing, but they had a different viewpoint. The 10, the doubters, this is what their report said. We can't defeat the enemy because they are too strong. Now, I would understand coming uh, with this conclusion if they had fought any battles. But how do you know that they're too strong 
if you haven't fought, if you haven't done anything. They haven't even tried. They were whipped before they even began. You see, fear destroys faith. Fear is an enemy. What did President Roosevelt say? He said the only thing to fear is what? Fear itself. I can't has destroyed more dreams than any two words in the English language. How do you know you can't? The Bible says I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The doubters said the walls of the cities were too thick and too tall. They hadn't even thought about of ways of busting through or digging under or climbing over them. They were just too thick. Too, we might as well give up before we ever begin. I think it's very, very ironic, and not happenstance, that the first city, 40 years later, unfortunately, that they invade in the promised land is Jericho. And what, what happens at Jericho? The great walls fall down. God was showing them, you were worried about these walls, let me show you what I'm going to do. What walls are too big in your life today? A broken relationship that you're still hurting from? Perceived weaknesses or handicaps, failures from the past, the devil tries to bring those up. And third, there were the giants. I just have a feeling, you know how, how many fishermen we have in the, in, the, in, the, in the room today? This can go for the good or for the bad. I caught a fish this big. But then, if it's something bad, we, we're even worse about it. And I imagine these giants, there were really, we were giants there, but I imagine by the time these guys got a hold of the tail, the, the giants got bigger. What do you think? Hadn't anyone told them the bigger they are, the harder they fall? Many years later, God would prove the doubters wrong as a teenage boy named David would single-handedly defeat a giant with a slingshot. And then his armies went out and defeated the Goliath's brothers who were giants also. What are the giants that you're afraid to face? Discouragement. There will always be someone around you to try their best to discourage you away from your dreams. Don't listen to them. Doubt. I'm not sure that will work. Can't afford to do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. Dismay. I'm just going to give up. I'm not even going to try. And the worst one of all is delay. I'll wait to tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. How many dreams have been lost because we waited till tomorrow? And last, the doubter said, they're everywhere. The enemies are, they're in the, they're in the Southland. They're in the mountains. They're by the sea. They're everywhere. They're, we're all going to die, 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 die. Sometimes people can't see the forest for the trees. When everything is crashing down on you so much that you can't even see the solution. The problems overwhelm you so much that you can't even hear the voice of a friend that can help you out of the situation. Sir Winston's Churchill after World War II, after he'd retired, he was asked to, to come back and speak to his alma mater. He got up, cleared his throat like he would do, and he said three words. Don't give up. Now those are powerful, but they're more powerful when they're coming from Winston Churchill and you're in England and you just went through World War II because that country's back was against the wall. The Germans were about to overtake them, but the British people did not give up and eventually hung on to victory. Now Joshua and Caleb, they had a totally different report. Saw the same things, but they had a solution. They said, if the Lord delights in us, then he will give us this land. They didn't. I don't care about all this other stuff. If God's, God's on our side, that's all I need to know. 
It's an exceeding good land. In other words, it was worth the fight. Sometimes we need to, we need to realize it's worth the fight. If we're standing in agreement for our children and our grandchildren, and it seems like that, that, that they're going to hell in a handbasket, it's worth the fight for us to continue to pray for them. They remembered all the miracles that God had already done in their lives on a daily basis. They knew that God required them to make the first step to see the miracle. This is important. You see, God spared Israel's firstborn during the last plague in Egypt only after they applied the lamb's blood to the doorpost. God parted the Red Sea only after the priest stepped into the water. That, 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 that must have been scary. In the New Testament, Peter was, was able to walk on the water only after he stepped out of the boat. Too many of us don't know how to step out of the boat. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go up now and let's possess the land. Let's not wait. They weren't going to delay. They understand. They understood what the psalmist said in Psalm 50.10 when it says, For every beast of the field is mine and the cattle upon a thousand hills. They were not going to limit their God based upon what they saw with their eyes. They were telling the people the same thing that Paul told the Corinthians, that we walk by faith and not by sight. These two men knew that anything God asks you to do, he is going to empower you to do it. Luke chapter 6 verse 38 says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together. Running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Mal Malachi 3.10 says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing, that you shall not have room enough to receive. Caleb and Joshua told the people that God would come to their defense. Psalm 18, 2 says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. Psalm 62, 2, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Saw the same thing. Had a different viewpoint of it. And finally, they had different outcomes. Saw the same thing, had a different viewpoint, and they had different outcomes. The ten spies, the doubters, received exactly what they believed for, and that is nothing. They and thousands of the other doubters in the next 40 years died in the wilderness. They never came in to the promised land. Their children did, but they didn't. They lived their lives wondering, what if? What if is a, is a haunting statement, isn't it? Now, God doesn't want to, to hang on to, to, to bad memories of the past, but, but wouldn't it be better instead of what if we would have done something or I wish I would have? For their entire lives, they lived outside of God's perfect will. But on the other hand, the believers, Joshua and Caleb, received exactly what they had believed for, and that is the promise. Years later, Joshua led the Israelites across the Jordan River. And God parted that river just like he did the Red Sea. Same type of miracle. Pulled down the walls of Jericho. Just watch miracle after miracle. And the battles were won and the nation began through the supernatural hand of God Almighty. And Caleb, I love Caleb. I think Caleb was probably older than Joshua. And by the time they came into the promised land, he was, he, he was pretty old. You know, Past retirement. <laughs> but that didn't stop him. He was ready to take his share. And he knew he had to fight for it. He said, let me at him. I love that attitude. Caleb knew it was worth fighting for. Years later, another believer faced another enemy in another crisis. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, David was on the run from King Saul. King Saul was trying to kill him, but he had other enemies also. And his ragtag army of only 600 men were surviving in a land of enemies on every side. And they were fighting the good fight, but then another enemy slips in and robs them, the Amalekites. 
Amalekites cause all kinds of problems. And they take everything that is valuable to David and his men. And they take their families and possessions and then they burn their homes to the ground. Nothing is left and it looks like all hope is gone. David and his men were very despondent. The Bible says that they wept until they had no more power to weep. That's pretty serious. Grown soldier men weeping that hard until they had no more energy to weep. Have you ever been in that situation? Some of us have. The men were so upset that they talked about, even talked about stoning David. They had to blame somebody. But in the middle of all this despair, in the middle of the worst thing that could happen, in the middle of hell on earth, David does something very unusual. Listen to me this morning. The Bible says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. He encouraged himself in the Lord. I believe he began to sing some of those psalms that he had written. The psalms actually are songs. That's what, that, that's, that's what it's translated at. He began to realize that the same God that had helped him defeat that lion years ago as a boy also helped him defeat the bear. And then later on helped him kill the giant. That that same God that had done it before will do it again. And he will do what he had promised to do. And even though it looked horrible, even though it looked dark, even though it looked like despair, he didn't know how God was going to do it. He didn't know when God was going to do it. He just knew that God was going to do it. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8, David asked the Lord, should I chase them, the Amalekites? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. Now, I want you to think about something here. A lot of times in our despair, a lot of times when, when we're crying out to God, we're saying, God, fix this. God, fix that. And we're not doing anything about it. Now, listen to me this morning. David did something. He knew he had to do something. He knew he had to step out. He didn't ask God to go catch them. He said, can I catch them? I, I know I have to have your anointing to do it. But he took a step to do that. David and his army caught up with the Malachites. And the Bible says that David recovered everything that the Malachites had taken, including his two wives. God bless them. You'd think one would be enough. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder. Their families were safe. David brought everything back. So this morning, what has God promised you? What has he planted in your life? Maybe you feel like the battle is too hard. Too many strong people, too many walls, too many giants, just too many. You want to believe it seems like you just can't. You want to stand up for what's right, but it just seems like you just can't. You want to claim God's promises for your life, but it seems like you just can't. You feel like you've been ripped off. You feel like you've been abandoned. You feel like you want to give up. Don't. I came out to tell you today that God will fulfill his promise, and he will restore it all. Nothing will be missing. Nothing will be left undone. I want to close with this today. A small congregation in the foothills of the Great Smoky Mountains built a new sanctuary on a piece of land willed to them by a church member. Now, 10 days before the new church was to open, the local building inspector informed the pastor that the parking lot was inadequate for the size of the building. How many have been through building programs, whether it's yourself or church, and you've hit stuff like this? Until the church doubled the size of the parking lot, they would not be able to use the new sanctuary they just constructed. But uh, to make matters worse, the church with its undersized parking lot had used every inch of their land except for the mountain against which it had been built. In order to build more parking spaces, they would have to move the mountain out of their backyard. You talk about taking scripture literal. Undaunted, undaunted, the pastor announced the next Sunday morning that he would meet that evening with all members who had mountain-moving faith. 
They would hold a prayer session asking God to remove the mountain from the backyard and to somehow provide enough money to have it paved and painted before the scheduled opening dedication service the following week. Whoa, he's stepping out there, isn't he? At the appointed night, time that Sunday night, 24 of the congregation's 300 members assembled for prayer. They prayed for nearly three hours. At 10 o'clock, the pastor said the final amen, and this is what he said. We will open next Sunday as scheduled. God has never let us down before, and I believe he will be faithful this time too. The next morning, as he was working in his study, there came a knock, a loud knock at his door. When he called, come in, a rough-looking construction foreman appeared, removing his hard hat as he entered. He said, excuse me, Reverend, I'm from a local construction company over in the next county, and we're building a huge new shopping mall over there, and we need some fill dirt. Would you be willing to sell us a chunk of that mountain behind the church? We'll pay you for the dirt we remove and pave all the exposed area free of charge if we can have it right away, because we can't do anything else on this project until we have the dirt in and allow it to settle properly. The little church was dedicated the next Sunday as originally planned, and there were far more members with mountain-moving faith on opening Sunday than there had been the previous week. Let's pray.